I'm the director of Lehigh University Art Galleries and professor of practice in the Department of Art, Architecture, and Design. And it's really wonderful to have all of you gathered here this evening for this special panel discussion. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces here, which is wonderful. But if you're a first time visitor here at the Art Galleries, we are a free public museum with almost 20,000 works of art now from diverse time periods and cultures. So we hope you'll come see us to view our exhibitions and to participate in our programs in the future. It really gives me great pleasure to welcome you here because as a campus-based museum, really our goal is to bring communities together to not only explore works of art, but to have critical conversations. And so that is what brings us together this evening. Um, this is part of our Art and Dialogue series, which really aims to talk about visual arts in connection with other subjects and all of the different connections that we can make across disciplines. Tonight, I am honored to introduce my colleague, Lucy Gans, um, who in just a moment will be introducing the other panelists that you see here. Uh, Lucy Gans is a printmaker and a sculptor, uh, she utilizes portraiture to explore social issues. Her work ranges, as you can see around us, from small photogravures and monotypes to individually carved figures and also larger scale installations. Her work gives voice to family narratives and stories of relationships that can include abuse, social violence, and abandonment through the layering of text and image. Lucy Gans's work is in many public and private collections, both in the U.S. and abroad. She's received the National Association of Women Artists Medal of Honor, the Peabody Award for her work in printmaking, and the Clara Shameless Memorial Award. And she has taught for over 40 years across schools and colleges in Ohio, New York, Alabama, and here in Pennsylvania. She has her MFA in sculpture for Pratt with a minor in drawing, and she studied painting and drawing at the Art Students League. Um, I also um, will mention Lucy joined the faculty of Lehigh in 1981, and she is currently a professor of art and Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. She's the first holder of the uh, Lewis and Jane P. Weinstock 36th Chair in Art and Architecture in the Department of Art, Architecture, and Design. So please uh, join me in welcoming Lucy Gans and our esteemed uh, panel of speakers this evening. I'm, I'm just going to use this one, if I, unless I turn it off. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I have three amazing people that I've invited to speak today. They're not only dear friends, but talented artists and brilliant scholars. Pat Bat is a painter who also makes artist books and his work is inspired by location filtered through experience and sensibility. She's been the recipient of many awards and prizes, including a National Endowment for the Arts Grant in Painting, artist residencies in the US and abroad. She's exhibited widely, including exhibitions in Brussels, New York, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, and places in between, and is Professor Emerita at Cedarcrest College. She received her MFA from the University of Pennsylvania and her BA from the University of California at Santa Cruz. I've known Pat for almost 40 years. I admire her work and value her friendship. I'm sorry, we have children almost, <laughs> great. We have children almost the same age and have often talked about the precarious balancing of all the we. Balancing Act, we perform that's um, between academia, art, family, and self. Jill Odegaard is an artist who explores dialogue and interaction as underlying factors in her work, be it through the handling of paper pulp, fabric, mark making, and armature, 
building in her studio practice or engagement in community projects. She relies on the direct exchange with materials and people. Jill Odegaard is a professor, is a professor and chair of the art department at Cedar Crest College in Allentown. She earned her MFA from Minnesota, Minneapolis College of Art and Design, sorry, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and her BFA from Minnesota State University at Moorhead. Um, Jill currently has an exhibition, Material Response at Cedar Crest College Center for Visual Research, and those works on exhibition represent, as she says, an accumulation of exploration of materials made during my her. Uh, sabbatical semester, spring 2023. I asked Jill as a fellow sculptor whose work is all about community, materiality, systems, and repetition, and I have the distinct honor of being the person she called when she was going into labor with her second child. <laughs> um, Suzanne Edwards is an associate <laughs> professor. I'm so good with it, so I want to <laughs> <laughs> Suzanne Edwards is Associate Professor of English and Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies here at Lehigh. She specializes in medieval European literature, feminist queer theory, and archive studies, with a particular interest in the collected papers and medievalist, medievalism of writer Gloria Naylor. Uh, Dr. Edwards has a BA in English and Music from Amherst College and her MA and PhD from the University of Chicago. I approached Suzanne as a feminist scholar, a literary critic, and WGSS colleague who digs deeply into image and text and generally, generously put my work into a broader context. She and both her children have visited my studio, studio several times and are the proud owners of some unfinished and finished work. <laughs> it was important to me, for me, to engage these women as artists, feminists, scholars, and mothers who have all negotiated that complex balancing act. Now I'll turn this over to Suzanne, who has graciously volunteered to lead this panel in our discussion. Thank you all. <laughs> Our plan for this afternoon is I'll ask a couple of questions for our esteemed panel to reflect on, and then we'll leave some time at the end for you to ask the questions that you have. Um, as Lucy mentioned, my entire family are big fans of Lucy Gann's art and artwork, and I think the focus of the panel today on the personal and the political suggests that that fandom has political ramifications. Um, the idea that the personal is political emerges out of second wave feminist activist insight that women's private lives are intertwined with larger social structures. The idea, which was revolutionary in the 1960s, is that women's relationships with spouses, with children, with female friends, are not just domestic concerns removed from the public sphere, but rather themselves sites of patriarchal oppression and also resistance. So I, our first question today is, how do you all, including Lucy, see Lucy's art engaging with this feminist history, reinterpreting the idea that the personal is political? Over there. <laughs> um, so I, I think first thought was I would actually, is this on? Okay, great. Um, just kind of turn it around and think about the political and the social justice um, content that Lucy brings to her work. So political and then personal and how she filters that through a personal lens and contemplates and thinks about societal um, concerns and, and the impact it has on her personally, I guess. So I, I, I first thought was to flip it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I also think in the question, um, the personal and the political, 
I think that Lucy's work is definitely has a what we consider a political statement. She writes those things. But when we think about the definition of political, it's really something that's not personal. It's 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 groups, it's the citizenship, right? And I think the act of making something and putting it out there is it also a political statement, a political act. So I think it works on both levels. Um, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit and possibly explain um, what my intention was and is and how I came into this idea of how important it was to give voice to people who did not necessarily have voice. And um, I have always done drawings. I started doing printmaking um, relatively recently, although I studied it in graduate school. Um, and my work has been pretty representational and figurative. And somehow I always felt with figurative work, there had to be some kind of context just as I think of people who do landscapes tend to be sort of environmentalists, and I think that what happens a great deal when you are doing creative work, you think about the people you are representing and also the people who you are not representing, but you are representing their voice. Um, so I did a project um, in 2007 called um, In Our Own Voice, and in that project I interviewed a lot of survivors of domestic violence. My intention was to do a gigantic installation. It was gigantic for me. It was in that studio there. There were 300 heads and they were mic'd with these voices of these women who were telling me how they had survived, why they had not left their abuser, how this started, all of these very intimate details of their lives, and there were things that they were not speaking out about. So I taped them, I used their voices, and I did the installation. There's a little corner of it over there. You can hear their voices on Spotify. But from that, I've always been concerned about women in the workplace, how we negotiate all of these different things. But from that point is when I started doing so much more research on violence against women. And then that spilled over into violence against children, et cetera. So I, I started getting more overtly political while still balancing the narrative of me and my family and how that also is a voice that needs to not be shouted, although I'm shouting now, but written almost invisibly sometimes into my pieces. So um, I'm going to stop. <laughs> um, so I, I think, you know, one of the things that your response raises, Lucy, is the ways in which um, your art is speaking with different communities, both your, in your own domestic environments and broader communities in the Lehigh Valley. I think one of the things that feminist histories do so well is to center their relationships among, among women. Um, the ways that women have taught, supported, and often generously critiqued one another. Um, so one of the things that I wonder from the three of you is, What's that history here in the Lehigh Valley? How have feminist artists, the three of you in particular, supported each other and each other's work um, here? Well, I'd say in, in so many ways. I mean, I think that it's so much about finding community and being open to community and um, that could be in a gallery, it could be in a living room, a coffee shop, a sharing life situations, and just being um, in a space of being willing to be vulnerable and open up through honesty, I guess. And I was fortunate to come to the Lehigh Valley and walk into the world with these two women, and 
I immediately had that community. And so that they, you know, had already been in the Lehigh Valley. And so, you know, as we walked in, I saw Lydia and I'm like, you know, the first time I saw, I met Lydia, we were, drop, I was dropping off work for an exhibition that you had coordinated for your women artists class. And you were here with your daughter and it's the first time I met you. And then from then on, like, I'm always intertwining. So, I mean, it's just a matter of like opening up, being open. And I think maybe that's a space where um, the personal, political, feminist ideas um, can be, I don't know, nurtured. I don't know how to really put it, but it's just there. <laughs> Also, I would say um, we moved here for our jobs, all three yeah. of all of us, and so we had to we had to find community. Um, it wasn't family that lived here, and um, I think the colleges in the area really provided that, and the art departments in the area. Um, we were from different art departments, and, and knowing that there are people here working in their studio is really helpful. I mean, that is in itself. Uh, kind of affirming um, energy, just to know that art is being made. Um, that, that's part of it too. So I would, I mean, we, we definitely would watch each other's work develop, but we also knew that we were, everybody was working, and I think that that's a part of it too. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is sort of showing up for each other, which is incredibly important and we try to do, and um, Pat has hosted all of us so many times in on their beautiful place, and we just look at their work and talk and talk about our children and talk about what we're doing and the food and have a wonderful time. So I would sort of credit you too for being sort of the center of our uh, art social community. Um, it's, Etc. But it's true, the universities, when I got here, I was um, in an all male department. Um, they had never um, hired a woman in a tenure track position in my department before. Um, and I was searching, really searching for other artists uh, to connect with and um, made the connection when got to know, and, and we have sort of formed a little group of all the sculptors in the Lehigh Valley, the, that teach at the schools in the Lehigh Valley, and get together and talk and exchange, etc. But that's, um, that's, that happened. Um, and I think that community ethos has had a transformative effect on Lehigh. Uh, part of our institutional history that maybe not everyone here knows is that Lucy was central in developing the WGSS program here at Lehigh. And can I just say like a show of hands, how many of us are affiliated faculty, graduates of the program, uh, students currently in the program, majors, people who've taken a WGSS class, people who want to take a WGSS class. <laughs> Um, I just think that sense of feminist community has created a home for so many of us here. And even though I didn't meet Pat and Jill until last week, I have a feeling that community is one that, you know, without the one that you had, I think we wouldn't have the same one we have here. So I'm really grateful to all of you for that. Um, maybe that brings us to a question more broadly about the way that art Feminist art in particular broadly engages with questions of the personal and the political. We've talked about Lucy's art, but I'm curious, Jill and Pat, how it plays out in yours, what other feminist artists you think about, and maybe at the, at the largest scale, why is art an important site for, for thinking through this feminist perspective? So I, I would say, thinking about my work, um, I first say, oh, I'm not a feminist. My work isn't a feminist work. It's not, you know, it's not political. 
And then we were sitting and talking, and all of a sudden we reveal like it is political because political means, in my opinion, is to have a voice and to speak your voice and to do that through art for me and um, find purpose and sense of validation in myself through my work. Um, my work has no specific relationships to like social justice and things. So sometimes when I think put my work next to Lucy's, I'm like, we just talk a different language, but we really we don't. You know, I mean, we're we're committed to our work, and um, I think I think it's really about um, finding purpose and validation, which is very much part of the feminist movement. Yeah, but Jill, I also think with your work, it's so much about materiality and putting things together in such a way that reminds me so much of women's work, embroidery, even though it's not, and small pieces that you put together to build larger pieces, and they're so tactile. And when I think into the history of women artists, it was very often women that were playing with paper, playing with wire, playing with these materials, taking those kinds of risks in non-traditional materials and forming them into shapes and forms, et cetera. So, anyway. Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> That's Lucy. No, She's okay. validating me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, would, I would talk more about from the narrative point of view, um, where I, I think the narrative is both um, extroverted or political, if you want to call it that, and personal. And I would say my work, there's a narrative element to it. I make books, and books naturally have a start and an end, and I see that as a narrative. Um, but I also tell myself stories as I work. Um, and I use my work as a way of remembering things. And I think that work in itself is a way of remembering or, or never forgetting, isn't it? way of saying it. So I think those are all links that we have. Yeah, and I also see with your work very often, I remember you talking about taking walks and coming up with colors and talking to yourself and then coming back and recording that in your paintings that are not, you know, they're not trees and they're not a path, but they're the colors that you've seen and how you're arranging them and they're just, so it, there is a narrative there, but it, it also makes us look at your work and go out and, whoa, that does really feel like that cornfield with that little bit of blue, even though it's not, you know, so anyway, and yes. And I would say another part of all of our art making is paying attention, yeah. and and I think that we are, we are paying attention, we want, the viewer to pay attention, and we want to acknowledge how wonderful paying attention is. You know, so. And difficult. Yes. <laughs> so, and I think that that's part of it. I think when you are making art um, all the time, and it's what you do, um, you open yourself up to things, and you hear, and you listen, and you pay attention, and unfortunately, you get all of it. So, um, which is sometimes probably how I ended up by doing those horrible pieces on school shooting. So that's, I, I, you pay attention. You can't help but pay attention, and certain things stick you right in the eye like a needle. So I'll pass this point. You know, it's one of the things about kind of finding balance, and like all of us have um, jobs, family artists, like all of these roles in our life and just trying to figure out how to do that and I think each of us have approached like it in a different way and I think that that is in a way it's sort of a, a statement on how to maintain that um, that path of an artist when that path is all the time being trying to be like torn down or you know brushed away or just trying to always stay stay on that path and you know, process, techniques, going to residencies. I mean, it's just really trying to find that path of balance, I think is super important. Yeah. Back there. 
Did you want to say something else? Nope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I just want to say what I heard, which was that art is a way of paying attention, and that mode of paying attention is itself political. That art is a way of never forgetting, of remembering, both in terms of narratives and in terms of uh, forms, material histories that might otherwise be forgotten. Because, and precisely because they are forms, material forms associated with women's, with women's work, right? Um, maybe you would all three talk a little bit about the way that your art, um, your work as an artist, informs the way you teach, or to borrow um, something from Jill, reverse that, how your teaching informs the way that, the ways that you have come to make and think about art. <laughs> um, well, I'm not teaching anymore, but as I was teaching, it was, it's very important that you teach what you believe. And so you have to teach from a place that you're interested in, and that ultimately starts with your own work. And so I found my work informed my teaching, and my teaching informed my work. And so at some point I was asked to teach printmaking, and it changed the way I worked because I became a printmaker, a painter printmaker. Yeah. But, um, and I really could see a very clear, um, direct result of what I taught. So I can say, be careful what you teach. <laughs> um, I think in terms of uh, my teaching informing my work, there is a constant conversation with students in the studio about process development, taking an idea, running with it, pushing it, and then the all ending thing is when is it finished? Is it ever finished? And with students, there is a deadline. We have deadlines too, but there's a deadline. It has to be done. We have to get it. We have to finish this. We have to move on to something. There's so much we need to cover. We need to um, have that group critique. You can do some iterations after the group critique and play with it a little bit, but it has to be done. And it's something, when I think of my own work, uh, I, I could probably keep working on pieces forever. So that kind of discipline that I'm imposing on my students, I then twist it back in and impose it on myself. That this needs to um, be, come to a point where I am comfortable with it, and if I'm not, then I make a new piece. And that's sort of my advice to them. And also the other thing is I teach this course on women artists that I love teaching and I do research into it all the time and I keep adding new pieces and what is so exciting about that class is students pick out different artists and different ways of looking at them than I would and I do and as they get more used to the course and my waving my hands around and knocking things over they will start to bring in their experiences from other classes, from their life, et cetera, and related to those artists that we've got to that time. A nice blend. Um, I think for me, as a teacher, I ask my students to experiment. I give them very little parameters. I teach sculpture, I teach paper making, um, some 2D design. But in those classes, I really, you know, just present some technique and really like walk away. Like this, my sculpture students are like, wire and what? And that's like, yep, yeah, what are you going to do with it? And really ask the student to come up with their own solutions and really kind of challenge those spaces. And um, so when I got went on sabbatical, you know, my my studio practice is. You know, like a little, like like Lucy said, I might be doing a little here and a little here, and then all of a sudden those little things come together because of the fragmentation of time and all of that. So I am given a whole like semester to for devote to, to my studio, and I walked in and I was a mess. Like I was like, 
I, I don't know what to do. I dialed back to being in college and go clean your studio. Something will happen. And I just kind of was in this space. It took me about a, close to a month to get into this spot where it's like, I just have to like do it. Like shut up and just do it. And and that's really kind of something that I want to instill in my students. Like they just have to be doing it. It's not going to come. There you can't have the idea. Show you gotta show up and you gotta do it. Yeah. And um, yeah, and just start to work with materials. So and, and not be afraid of making bad stuff. Yeah. We learn. We yeah. learn yeah. through the bad stuff yeah. as well. And the mistakes. Yeah. yeah sorry. No, that's it. That's it. So <laughs> experiment. <laughs> I mean, we talked about your relationships with each other, um, your uh, kinds of community that you build with your students, and I wonder if you see connections or distinctions between those kinds of community and the ways that you hope viewers engage your art, or maybe how you as viewers engage Lucy's art. You know, what's the relationship between the work of art and the viewer? that you're striving toward, if, if, if you have designs on that. Well, I think that just like in teaching, you have to, um, the teacher, I mean, I learned from my students, right? I mean, you learn, it's a back and forth, and you, you're sort of open to the experience, and um, you're also setting up a place where people can fail. And failure doesn't mean getting it wrong, it just means it's an angle that you want it to re, re, um, re find a new path. And I think in looking at work for, for a viewer, it's the same thing. You, you come at it, you look at it, you try and understand it, and you try from different angles, and different days, and different places in your own place. And, and art, can live on and be many different, one piece of art can live on and be many different things. And there's no, all of them are right in the moment, that they're those things. And I would say what I hope art does is allow people to stand before it and not know what they're supposed to do and just respond to it and just be present and just notice, right? I'm always a little bit, and when I started putting text into my work, I was a little bit concerned that people would read it instead of looking at it. So my text is uh, a veil behind, sometimes it's overt, but most of the time it isn't because I really don't, it's, not necessarily my voice in a lot of these. Clearly, it's my face. Uh, I'm just a stand-in. But I really want those letters, those images, those gestures to not be about me and my interpretation, but to be able to be something that's more, um, that sparks something in you, um, that you can look at it and say, oh, is that, you know, I, I remember that, I remember that, I love that touch, I can remember feeling that way about my child, I can remember those letters I wrote, do people write letters anymore, or different things along those lines, or really that's a statistic, I, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so I'm hoping that my, um, it, it sort of is a little weird for me to keep looking at my face <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of going to go like this, but um, I really do hope that I'm approaching someone so that they can look at it and learn and listen and interpret it in their own way, not in my, so most of the time the, te the titles of my pieces are just a line from the text. It's not necessarily what the piece is about at all. And I think you're, as an artist, you're giving, you're presenting marks, images, text, as an invitation to the viewer to take time and be with the work, to understand it, to let it 
evolve and sort of come into clarity. And that's one thing I talk with my students a lot about is that, uh, you know, just, just allow yourself, give yourself that gift of time to just be in front of the work, to see what it can reveal. Because, you know, at first glance at some of Lucy's work, it's, it's like you start reading and it's like, I can't read it. But then you go back in and you can kind of be there in a different way and you can, it stirs empathy and, and new connections. And, but at first glance, maybe you don't want to go there. Right, but you have if you give yourself that space to be with work, I think that's that's just a life lesson. I mean, and I'll just share a little personal story here, which is that you know, I think for my kids because they met you in person, especially Charlie, who visited Lucy's studio, and Lucy showed them all of the goodies around, they all around there it was like, you know, the fantasy of like staying, you know, just like going to a magical place. But I think for them actually seeing the images of your face, someone they have met in person are really crucial for the, in, you know, the, the, the larger political resonance for them, right? That's their very particular personal response to it, right? Um, like. Not just that you're an artist, but that you're anchoring these things that are broader social concerns for them, personalizing them, you know. Um, well, maybe I'll ask one more question and then we'll turn it over to this crowd who I know will have uh, um, incredible questions of their own. Um, but Virginia Woolf. You know I'm a literary scholar, so I had to go there. Um, Virginia Woolf anticipated the idea that the personal is the political, because she argued that to write a novel, to write at all, she needed a dedicated domestic space, a room of one's own. And later, Andre Lord argued that poetry is, quote, the most economical of all art forms, end quote, because it does not require even the luxuries of a room of one's own and uninterrupted time. Poetry, she said, can be scribbled down between shifts as a nurse at a hospital on scraps of paper. So I want to ask the three of you, inspired by those feminist heroes of mine, how have, oops, uh oh, can I do something? How have um, the material conditions of time and space influenced the kinds of art you've made over the course of your careers? I don't know if I, did I turn it up? Is it's it flashing green? Yeah, it's flashing. <laughs> Hopefully it will. It's good. Okay. That's the technical solution. <laughs> Turn it off and on. Reboot. <laughs> now it's red. Now it's red. Shut it down. Okay. Oh, no, it's your green. Oh, okay. <laughs> now it's good. Do you need to ask that? No. Okay. No, no. I think, um, so, yeah, I mean, I, space, I do not have the luxury of having a beautiful space to call my own. I have a little space here and a little there and a little there, um, which has greatly impacted my work. and. And in a way, it makes it more accessible to me because I can be doing my work in a lot of ways. Um, I can do my work when I'm riding the Bieber bus into New York, when I had my studio in New York, or I can be sitting on the couch watching TV and bending wire at the same time, and just being like around my family. I can be um, visiting friends and take it, the work out to the patio. I mean, it, it's, it's very accessible in these spaces. So I think that it's actually been, um, I don't know, circumstances just sort of make the work, I guess. I don't know where I'm going with that. but. Um, I think that the space that I have had as studios has had a profound effect on my work. Um, when I had a large studio with large space and a sweepable floor, I was doing more sculpture. When I had a smaller studio, um, I did smaller work. When I had children, 
I remember doing tiny little pastel drawings with my son in the, yes, I used to play pen, in the play pen, and I would go and work and work, and then I would look at him and I would pick him up and do things, and I noticed that I stopped using white clothing on him because there were so many fingerprints of ink and stuff. So I, I worked smaller and put things together. Um, and the studio that I have now up in um, Building C has been primarily for me a printmaking studio and sculpture and everything. So I'm sort of babbling, but sorry. Um, but it has had a profound effect, and the whole thing of time, it's true, we're so used to our time being fragmented that we can grab an hour here, a couple hours here, we can go look something up, we keep notes, we do that, and when you all of a sudden are on leave, or in a residency, and you don't have to cook dinner, and you don't have to do this, and you don't have to teach your class, any of those things, it sometimes is incredibly liberating and paralyzing at the same time. So I, I know that before I'm going on a residency, I have so many obsessive plans, I don't follow them, but I want to make sure I don't waste that first day, that first week, etc. And sabbaticals are the same way, so it does make a big difference. Well, I'm somebody who needs, I'm a Virginia Woolf, yeah. I need a room of my own, and I've had it, I've been lucky, fortunate enough to have it. Um, so I have a great studio, um, I sh in the beginning, when, we, when I lived in New York, I had it, my own studio, but it had a wall between my studio and my husband's studio, who's a sculptor. And I found that a little problematic because every time the power tools, first of all, I needed a full wall because I couldn't get the dust in my paint. But every time the power tools went on, I just sort of wanted to hear if there was a scream after it. <laughs> um, so I have, I have a separate studio that's mine. And I, I do work, um, I have strategies to work. So I have a, um, if I have a small studio, I make small postcards that I send to myself. If I have a big studio, I do other things. Um, when I was teaching, I would maybe start a new painting every Thursday just to, I wouldn't finish it, but I would start one. Um, just strategies that get me in there and get, keep me going. And I continue that. And um, that's one thing that it took me a little while to learn is you had to really make space and say that your studio work is important. You need this time. You are not going to answer the phone. You're not going to look at an email. You're not going to do that. You just shut things down and have that, even if it's only two hours. Even if it's you know one afternoon a week for a couple of weeks, you have to carve that time out. And I found for me, it's better if it's sort of the same time period each day or every other day or something that I'm not so good if I could do it first thing in the morning and last thing at night and in the middle of the day, etc. Although we steal hours whenever we can, but it's best if you set up a sort of schedule for yourselves along those lines. Yeah, sort of. Or in other words, reclaiming your time yeah. is a political act. <laughs> well, I'm so grateful to be in conversation with the three of you, and I know this audience will want to be too. Um, who wants to ask the first question? And Stacy, should I just bring the... Yeah. Or I could do that. Yeah. Um, who wants to ask a question? Okay. In looking at your work, I mean, your face is always evident. And the words are something that you are drawn into, I think, after looking at the piece. But what comes first? I mean, is this sort of the chicken and egg question? Um, or do you have these images of your face? Or how does that come about? I mean, do you start with the, the written word? Or how do they, how do they blend? Um, I um, never start with the written word. Um, I start with the images and then I build them up and the, um, when I first started putting text into my work, um, it's those two little self-portraits over there where I was in the studio and I was drawing, etc. And I had all those 
thoughts one has when you're by yourself and they're flooding in. So I started writing them into my hair because I can hide anything in my hair. <laughs> so, I, um, so I did that. But with the other pieces, the image comes first and then over top of it is the text. And as you can see, if you go in the other room, those are all my outtakes, and it's only like a tiny, tiny percentage of my outtakes. So I have the image, I go over it, I think about possibly what I want to layer on top of it, I get the, the combination that I like or think is working, and then I stop, I don't make an addition. I just have these pieces and I put the text over top. So you start with your own image. I start with my own image, or I start with these uh, photo, these photogravure pieces of hands of my family and things like that. But I do start with it, and they are from photographs. So I've taken photographs. Um, I had the only photographs that I didn't take are those four over there that I made my husband take my picture. Right. So if you can see, I have both of my hands are free because the rest of the time I either put it on timer and then it goes, and then I go like that, it's terrible. So I use a, a whatever it is, the cable release thing. So you'll see most of them, there's only one hand or no hands, uh, but those less did and he got some. So I always start with, I start with the image and photograph them and then I play with it in terms of print. Um, and layer it, et cetera, and then I add the text to it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm on. You got it. So I, I'm really interested in the um, discussion you know, we're having about activism. Well, um, and I've been thinking as well about the interest in artivism that I see moving through a number of classes on campus. And of course I know art and activism have a very long history, um, but I do think there's something about this moment that makes artivism very appealing to be part of, whether as a creator or as a viewer. And I'm interested in how you think art is functioning for this generation right now. Is it new? Is it just that I'm, I'm seeing it in new ways? Um, and I'm also thinking about that word empathy, because it seems to me that in the visual arts in particular, empathy is a big piece of artivism. Um, so I, I just wondered if, if you had any thoughts on that. Um, I am so, I mean, the, the, the joy of teaching is that you are around people that are so optimistic and full of energy, and I think for them, um, this whole movement of being able to combine uh, their art, however they do it, with a purpose and with interventions, with um, things that they are passionate about that are political. So I think that this generation and will be pushing this and it speaks to them and it also gives them a kind of voice. And although um, I, I hate to bring it up, I think that social media is a way for them to get work out there and also get an exchange. Now it may just be one piece that they're pushing there or, or seeing or resonating with, but I think that um, art has become more, for a lot of people, art making has become much more accessible. Um, and um, you, as you say, they don't all need a studio. Everybody's got a phone. Um, and they can do it all on a phone, computer, or just draw. But I think um, it's it's a good time for that because politically and environmentally and socially, it's a pretty scary time. So I think that they uh, will be able to <coughs> push for this. And the collaborative element too, yeah. like being open to that idea of collaboration, which really comes out of the feminist art movement. Um, you know, I think that's a huge aspect of, of 
accessibility and inclusion for sure. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Or oh, two. We can take two. <laughs> teaching 2D design. It opened up this whole world that I first was introduced to as a student, and it was the foundation elements of design, elements and principles of design. And as I started to really focus on that very intentionally as a teacher, it just um, brought my work to life in a new way. And um, it's where I hang my hang my head all the time. And um, so I think that, that was a, had a huge impact. It moved it into a different space for me. I mean, I've been doing this a long time, and I just, I start to see that certain themes for myself circle back. And if I, instead of it being a circle, I like to think of it as a spiral, because maybe it's getting a little better. But um, you just, you know, you're interested in certain things, and they keep yeah. Um, I think time and space enters into that. So when I think um, of different of moving and moving a studio, um, of um, starting to do printmaking um, as a graduate student, and for the first uh, we'll say eight years after graduate school, my work was really about materiality, time. Um, and was not at all figurative. Um, and then I started working into landscapes and then did these installations that were big landscapes and created these weird little villages with drawn backgrounds of like, I did a 30 foot drawing. So um, I was told that children um, in the first uh, three months of life um, sleep all the time. <laughs> so I I was having a show and I saved the 30 foot drawing till after my son was born. And as you can imagine, it was bizarre. But anyway, it was a very interesting, it turned out entirely different than I expected because he was not a sleeper. Never. He still isn't. But anyway, so there are different things like that that, again, the, um, the becoming more representational, more figurative in my work. I still do landscape, but they're totally abstract. They're just about color and shape and, and texture. Um, and this work was really uh, thinking about the themes that have circled through my work for the past, I don't know, 20 years? How long? It's like 30 years. So this is sort of a... A, a weird representation. I didn't answer your question, but sorry. <laughs> um, so, in the fine tradition of academic symposia, I will front this by saying this is more of an observation than a question. But, but I will get to a question at the end, I promise. Um, so, I'm a cognitive scientist, a cognitive psychologist, and in listening to the three of you talk about your work and the implications of it in your community, I can change studio to lab, and I can change um, piece to paper, or to experiment, or to whatever it may be, and I feel like the 
the power of the themes that you're talking about, attention, the, the memory, the, the process of working in little bits here and there, isn't what artists do, it's what we all do. Oh, exactly. And, and it, it just feels so refreshing to hear it from another um, standpoint and to say, yes, we, we are all doing this. And then it prompts me to think, where am I polit potentially political in studying human multitasking? How would I think about that in a political frame? Um, and so the, the fact that these experiences and, and kind of what it takes and how we do it are crossing the, the disciplines, um, my question will be, um, where is that interdisciplinarity for you? And of course, it's a term we hear all the time at, at Lehigh now, interdisciplinarity. But do you find that the, the thought of working in the political spaces suggests to you that there is a, a connection to be made in, in doing work with a scientist or with a politician, or you know, where do you find your art connecting in other ways? Um, so that will be my question, but thank you all so much for, for connecting in a way that was great at the end of a long work day. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I think ultimately it's a conversation. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm having a conversation with the piece I make, but the piece and me are also having a conversation with everyone. And, Conversations can happen between all different disciplines and between all different people and between all, all of that. So I, that's what I hope, it's a conversation. And it's an open-ended one, too. I have to say that I learned um, an incredible amount when I was doing the In Around Words uh, project. I had to go in front of the IRB. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what it was standing for in the internal review board, and I had to get permission because I was using human subjects, and I'm going, human subjects? Oh my god, but I learned a great deal. I was coached through, and then they said, nah, this is art. You don't have to do it. Well, it's okay. You're fine. And, but it was really interesting, and the other thing was learning how to interview people, um, and also how not to trigger particular reactions. So I got a lot of coaching that helped me when I started thinking about political and difficult and social things. Uh, I need to back up and not just get in your face and ask you all of these questions, but think instead, put myself in your shoes and say, Okay, I need to be more empathetic. I need to uh, understand what you are thinking and seeing and how you may interpret it and step back and let you have the conversation. And as you know, it's really hard for me to let people get a word in advice, so. But anyway, it was really, so that to me was a start for this whole sense of conversation between other disciplines and how do you get that work done in your field? Wow. Oh my god, I could never do it. <laughs> anyway. And part of my work, so I go into the studio and I'm with my material and I'm responding to the material and it, that's that me time of, you know, validation and all of that. But another component of my work is community engagement. Mm -hmm. And that came about through teaching teaching a women artist class and thinking about the sense of collaboration and being open to connecting and doing work with others. And so that whole arena draws from all sorts of disciplines, interactions, psychology, sociology, communication, um, which I think is one of the kind of more most exciting things about art and social practice is that we are able to have those conversations and draw from other disciplines in a really rich manner and intentional. Well, I want to thank you all for being a wonderful audience. I want to thank especially Stacey Brennan for organizing everything. And I know that you will join me in thanking our panelists 
Joe Odegaard and Pat Pat, and especially in celebrating Lucy Gantz.